blessed to have musicians like we do. And uh, thank you. So grateful for uh, not just the band, but the, the content of what we're able to sing together and be reminded of some amazing, amazing things. And uh, just thank you, band, for leading us in music today and worship. And Church, good to be with you. Psalm 73 is where we're going to be hanging out here in a, in a few moments. Um, today, uh, got uh, a little uh, announcement to make, a little bit deeper than, than Ryan's announcement. He gets the light stuff, I get the heavy stuff. So um, it's a bittersweet announcement this morning that uh, we uh, will have Jacob Morris no longer with us beyond next Sunday. Um, he's, he's moving to, uh, I wouldn't say greener pastures, but... Um, uh, bigger pastures, you know, one of the things uh, being Jacob's pastor and mentor and coach and friend as, uh, as he's been involved here at Missio Day for the past three and a half years, it's flown by, hasn't it? It's cruised by so fast. One of the things I knew was that one of these days, Jacob would be moving on, and I'm thinking, you know, Nashville, record contract, we'd be seeing him on the, the CMA Awards, right? He's up there with Kenny Chesney, like, hey, great to be songwriters with this guy, right? And, um, and yet, that's not what's happening with Jacob. Uh, he's staying in town, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's a church in the valley that uh, called him to uh, help them do music for them, and I said, well, that's not fair, that's wrong, that's not God's will, because that's usually the way I respond when when people leave and uh but you know he's not leaving as you guys have always heard me say we're expanding our reach of 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 who we are as a church and Jacob is the the product quote unquote product of what we've been able to to do in his life what he's been able to do with us as a church community and uh he just feels it's a season for him to to be a part of a of a, a, another ministry and uh so he and I have spent the past probably month talking and praying and wrestling through all this stuff together. I wrestled. He just, he's at peace with it. So, uh, and that's just, that's just your pastor's heart there. But um, so next Sunday will be Jacob's last Sunday with us. So uh, you get a chance to love on him and just appreciate him and, and just let him know how thankful you are for, for his life and what God's been able to do. And so, uh, and, but with that said, you know, we've always got, uh, we've got a deep, deep team when it comes to the music team and Jorgen's going to be stepping up and becoming our music guy here at the church so I haven't even said hi to you this morning and I'm like is he even here and there he is hiding out right there stand up Jorgen if you guys don't know Jorgen Greg Jorgen's been with us for a while too and uh and Jorgen really has you know he's got this call in his life to become uh just he loves music in the church, and uh, he's got a lot going on. New new role here. He's getting married in December uh, to uh, to Esther, his way better half. So Esther, good job. Um, so J Jorgen's be stepping up, and we've got some new new people waiting in the wings to get involved with music. So music's going to continue, of course, uh, but we're going to miss our our brother Jacob. And so uh, we had talked, and he just said, "I want to share just what God is doing." Here, I, I got a mic for you. Are you uh, Look at that. No one told me. Look at that. This it. is why they pay me the big bucks right here. So, um, But Jacob just wanted to share just a testimony, just what God's been able to do in his life and uh, just share his heart with you. So uh, I gave him 30 seconds. So because, uh, uh, you know, we don't we don't celebrate sellouts here at, at church. Um, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, that's why the cake was here. Yeah, for today. yeah, yeah. We brought we brought cake, cake for jo uh, Jacob. Thank but, you, Cindy. Um, but go ahead, Jacob. No, just I, uh, um, take it away. I'm gonna. Um, do you want me to stand here? Or you you want just, me to yeah, I would love your favorite. Okay, yeah. I'll just stand like you. This. Just be patient. That's I. You know, I'm learning patience. It's, it's right, a good. It's, so. a, it's a good one. Um, yes, uh, church. Uh, Scott's right. I, I, I've I've taken another opportunity. Um, another church and. Something that happened really fast, and it was it was almost unexpected to a degree, but uh, it was something that, that was in my heart to look for something that was just uh, maybe a new challenge or something that that um, could 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 again further my faith, further my walk, further my just overall experience, even as a musician that's that's serving God in a in a manner. And um, you know, uh, it's 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 been incredible the past three and a half years to be a worship leader for you guys and to, for this church because. Uh, I was a very different believer three and a half years ago, and um, 
it's funny that, that it kind of happened how it did because about three and a half years ago was also when I started playing out as much as I did. And I started playing bars. I started, you know, getting on the road and started really pursuing music. And I think that if it wasn't for Scott, if it wasn't for this church and, and this fellowship that's here, I would be a very, very lost man. And um, I'm really, really thankful for everybody here that has supported me, that has, has loved on me, that has um, just given me so much um, love. It's really what this church has, and God is working here um, so much, and it's been an absolute honor and blessing to, to have a privilege to, to, to lead music. Um, you know, there's, there's so many things in the outside world as, as somebody who sings secular music that, you know, drugs and alcohol and women, it's, just, it, it's insane. And without the guidance that I've had, from, I, I, I don't know where I'd be, so thank you. Thank you, every single one of you that, is, that has been there for me and has um, been a friend, been, a, been just a, a, an overall companion to, to my fellowship. It's, it's really um, an honor. Um, I, I want to say huge things about um, the band, the worship band. Um, that is, some, some are here, uh, some aren't. They are incredible. They make my job. Yes, please give them a round of applause. They are... So they, they, they come early, they come prepared, and they, they, they volunteer so much time and serve for this church and for, for God and for you guys. And it's, it's, they, make my, they make it look like I know what I'm doing, which is great. So uh, thank you to, to every single one of you that has helped serve with me. It's, it's, it's been amazing. You know, to, even when I'm running on three hours of sleep from the night before and I walk in here at 7.30 to see everybody just in a good mood, it's it's. it's uh, so refreshing, and and I, and I love this band. I love Jorgen. I'm so excited for Jorgen. Yeah. Jorgen and I, um, Jorgen and I have been playing for a bit, but we really became really good friends the past year, year and a half. And uh, he has such an incredible heart for God. He has an incredible heart for this church, and he has such an incredible heart for worship. And I'm just so excited to see what he's going to do. Um, I love you, man, and and thank you for for being a friend. I I look up to you in so many ways, man. So thank you. And I'm just, I'm, I'm wanting the best for, for everything. And then I want to say another big, huge thank you to Scott for being uh, a fantastic mentor to me. Every single week, Scott and I have had a chance to meet, um, you know, when, when we're in town for the last three years or so, man. It's just crazy. Awesome. We read books. We talk about life, love, careers, everything. And it's just, it's so, it's so amazing to have somebody like that in your life where you can just kind of open up and, and, and share your heart with somebody. And, and I think it's important. Really, it showed me how important that is. For, for a walk of faith is to have somebody to talk to in that regard. And so thank you, Scott. You're thank welcome. you for always setting me up for success from day one. And um, I'm going to miss you guys. I'm going to miss this church dearly. And uh, I, I, again, I'm not leaving, so I, I really want to see you guys, and I hope that we can, you know, remain close. And I, I want to hear all the, the great things that are doing here at Missio. And um, I'm really, really excited for the new chapter for you guys. And thank you for giving me the, the privilege to, to be here the last three years. It's been an honor. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Amen. Maybe. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pray. What? There it is. <laughs> how how we change throughout the years. So. Oh. Uh, let's pray for uh, for Jacob. This new chapter for us and a new season and. Uh, if you would just join me in your hearts and minds. Father, thank you for Jacob and the, the man he just continues to become according to your will and your plan. May the things that have been planted as seeds over the years come to fru- full blossom and fruition. Lord, more than anything else, may he continue to pursue you. May he be a man after your own heart. Use him not only in ministry, but use him in the the world that is distant from Christ. Lord, through his, not just his music, but just who he is as a person, his character and his integrity. Lord, may he speak volumes about the personal work of Christ. Thank you for the, the time we have had with Jacob and the, the investment on, on all fronts, Lord. None of it has been wasted. It has been used for your purposes, for your kingdom. Thank you for his life, Lord. Um, We're going to miss him, but we know you're going to do great things in him and through him. Lord, as you prepare uh, an exit for him, we prepare for the entry of uh, Jorgen and and, uh, just a new season where we get to 
again, come to you in music as a means of worship to know you and grow in Christ. Lord, uh, be glorified in all things. Thank you for your plan. Thank you for your love for us, the church. And thank you, Lord, for being our God. And we just commit all this into your care. Amen. Amen. Love you, dude. I was going to say, it, do you have a breakup song in your, in your uh, <laughs> might be a good time. Good, good time. For, so, thanks, Jacob. Uh, can I get a tissue? My, you know, I, yeah, that works. It's better than my sleeve. Does anyone have a sleeve I can borrow, right? So, uh, Psalm 73, turn there in your Bibles if you would. Um, speaking of music, we, we forget that the Psalms are, it, it's music. The Psalms is God's book of music for his people. And uh, what I love about the Psalms is that there is such a wide range of musical styles in, in the book. And uh, here, here's really the question for the church. And, and I think most of you, if not all of you, would agree with this. It seems like we are inundated with so much positive music out there, we ask ourselves, like one person asked, what songs are there that miserable, miserable people can sing? You ever thought about that? Like, you know, we like the Jesus is my boyfriend song. Yeah, yeah, la, la, you know, and just it's all ha ha happy and cheery. But where are the songs miserable people can sing? Because we, and I'm talking specifically church music. Because if you really look at the, uh, the contemporary state of, of church music, you know, a lot of it is just affirmation of the positive and what God's doing. And, and, and yet, I think we would all be able to agree together that sometimes I don't feel happy and la la. Sometimes I don't feel all joyful and like praise Jesus. Where are the songs we could just really just wrench our hearts out before God? You ever thought about that? Where are the songs saying, I don't feel like saying praise God right now. I feel like saying, God, I'm mad. Doggone it, God. Where's the song that says, can I just be angry with you? I've got some things stirring in my heart, and I, and I don't feel like having a smile on my face right now because life seems unfair. Imagine picking up an album with songs filled with that kind of music. People are like, what are you listening to, Mr. Depresso, right? Like, bummer. And yet, this is the book of Psalms. There are some psalms in psalms that just talk about, you know, God, life doesn't seem like it's going the way I want it to go. What are you doing? Do you even care about me? What are the songs miserable Christians can sing? Well, Psalm 73 is one of them, in case you're asking. <laughs> this morning, we get to look at Psalm 73, and we get to look at perhaps one of the age-old questions regarding faith and God and is, it's, it's why God does it seem like the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer Lord I look at the world around me and the people around me and it seems like those who really hate you are getting all your good gifts and those who are trying to make an earnest effort at following you and love you don't get anything have you have you ever felt that like, if God, you say you're a God of love, but I'm not feeling your love right now. It seems like you're loving the wicked rather than the righteous. Or if you're, if you're loving, you certainly aren't powerful because if you're powerful to, to change this, why don't you? Because from my understanding, this is not what I signed up for. And let me just tell you, if you signed up to follow Jesus because of the easygoing road that he would have for you going forward, you signed up with the wrong Jesus. Right? If you were sold a bill of goods and someone said, you come to Jesus and you've got no more problems, they're a liar. Because I think, in my experience, is that you sign up for Jesus and your problems become exacerbated. And that's a weird thing, right? Like you come to know Jesus as Lord, as Savior, like, wow, someone knows me and accepts me and loves me and, and can do something with this wretched, wayward, rebellious heart. And then you sign up for it and you're like, but this isn't what I expected. This is hard. 
This is tough. I get angry. I get frustrated. God, are you even there? Do you even care? So here's a song that us miserable Christians can sing. We should put this in music. Jorgen, we're going to work on that, right? Psalm 73 set the music, right? See, the problem isn't this. Does God exist? The question is this. Is God just? Is God just? fair because all of us as humans have wrestled with this there was a woman hundreds of years ago called Teresa of Avila I think we need to come back with names like that like I'm Scott of Chandler he's Jacob of Mesa Teresa of Avila she's the one who said when we get to heaven we're going to realize that the toughest of our experiences on earth were like one night at a really bad hotel But here's what she said in addition. She said this, if this is how you, God, treat your friends, no wonder why you have so few of them. Man, I like that. Then again, I don't like that. Psalm 73 helps us navigate these difficult waters. Is God just? Is he fair? What is he doing when it seems like the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? What's he up to? How do we make sense of it? What are things that we should avoid when we're asking this question? And what are some things we need to pursue when this thing is infiltrating our hearts and our minds? Let's look at this this morning. Two points, Psalm 73. Let's read it in its entirety, and then we'll go back and we'll kind of piece together what I think are the, 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 the important points. Psalm 73, written by a man by the name of Asaph, and he was, uh, along with his family, in charge of music for the people of God. And that's what you have in Psalms. You have Psalms, most of them attributed to David, but there's other writers as well. So Asaph, Starts verse 1 and says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Doesn't seem so bad, does it? Well, let's take the plunge because it goes downhill from here. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. And let's just not lie. We've all felt this when we've looked at other people in our lives. Therefore, his people return to this place. The waters of abundance are drunk by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the most high? Behold, these are the wicked. And always at ease, they have increased in wealth. Surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. And if I had said, I will speak to this, this, behold, I should have betrayed the generation of, of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Surely you do set them in slippery places. You do cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden tears. Like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and arrogant and I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand and your counsel, with your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. And I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your works. May God bless the reading of his word. 
this morning. Now, I'll gladly turn the pulpit over to anyone that wants to take this message from here to navigate this. This is not easy territory. I'd rather talk about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We're comfortable in Psalm 23. We have to wrestle through this because this is the journey for every single one of us. And the, and the real issue before us is this. Will you be self-focused or will you be God-focused? Here's what we're going to talk about this morning. Being self-focused means you will maintain a temporal perspective that consumes. If you don't break out of the self, you will live a life where you will be consumed by all the things that were consuming the psalmist in the first half. But if you're God-focused, you will choose to embrace an eternal perspective that comforts. And the choice is yours. You either focus on yourself or you focus on God. I love the simplicity of the teachings of the Bible, but it's a whole lot harder to put into practice. Amen? Will you focus on yourself or will you live in a God-focused state? Because if you focus on you, you will be consumed by all the things that we're going to talk about this morning. But we will talk about once that descent and that that spiral happens in all of our hearts how do we get out of that spiral and start our ascent back up to what god wants so there are going to be a couple things we talk about when it comes to being self-focused and what the psalmist wrestle was with but i want to give you application of how we begin the journey out of those pits so that god will comfort our hearts the way he's designed to comfort us so here we go being self-focused and being consumed by it now granted look at verse one circle it we start off strong right none of us would be in disagreement with the psalmist but how quickly he plunges into despair right how quickly he he plunges into this attitude of resentment and that's and that's really what you feel throughout this this first half of the psalm now notice the last verse verse 28 he comes back to the goodness of god Right? So this is good. So there's a, there's a cycle happening. He bookends the, the song with the goodness of God. It's what happens in between when we allow our hearts to take over, when we focus on ourselves and that downward spiral. What, what do we need to do to get up out of that pit? So here's the minor problem. And let's, and let's just talk about this. The minor problem here is that there's a mentality among the psalmist that says, virtue should always be rewarded and the wicked should always be punished. And, and let's be honest, we're all justice junkies, aren't we? We all are like, well, that's the way I would operate the universe. That's the way I would deal with the righteous and the wicked, right? We're going to always reward the virtuous, and we're always going to punish the wicked. Well, good news is you're not God, and neither am I. See, that's the minor problem. Here's the major problem, is that... This man is writing from a place where resentment has taken over his heart. We are not here to talk about the justice or lack of it in our world. We are here to talk about the resentment that resides in our hearts. You're like, I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to be here. I'm going to go home and watch the Cardinals game, all right? Right, because we would rather talk about all the justice or lack of justice in our world. But with worship, and you guys didn't know this, when we come together on Sunday mornings, God has one objective, and that is to get a hold of your heart. This is the problem. The problem is not that which you cannot control, nor even try to attempt to control. The problem lies within and who you will be before a God who's got plans far superior than you could ever come up with. The major issue is that resentment has led this man to criticize God and that criticism has hindered his walk. And I am praying for the spirit to diagnose whatever's going on within our hearts this morning so that those hindrances are removed and that you see God more brilliantly and brightly than you ever have. This is a descent into this person's doubt and turmoil. And it's, it's, like, it's, it's like Robin Leach was here talking about the lifestyles of the rich and famous. You guys remember that show? I'm, I'm just super old, aren't I? Yeah, I thought so. Let's think of it like this. I was thinking about 
the fact that one thing that God has pressed upon me in this is I was thinking about the kids and donut challenge, right? where they walk into a preschool and they've got a whole box of donuts and they tell the kids, right, like, here's the choice. You can have one donut now, or if you wait an hour, you can have six donuts later. You guys know about that challenge? Who would be in the one donut now category? Raise your hands. Who would be in the six donuts in an hour category, right? Easier said than done because I'll tell you, the kids that chose the wait, when they're sitting there watching those kids mow down on those no- donuts, they're kind of like, maybe I should just get one now, right? Like, I'm tired of seeing everyone licking their lips and the powder and all their fingers, and they're like, that looks so good. And the kids are like, oh, this is so delicious, and this is amazing, best donut I ever had. And those kids are sitting there waiting going, I bet it's good, and I'm trying to with, you know, hold, a little, hold it all together and exercise some self-control, but I know that there's a bigger reward coming, right? And how God does that with his kids. He says there are pleasures now, but those pleasures now are not to be compared to the, the multi-pleasures yet to come. Right? God wants you to know that while this world is temporary, while there are pleasures that could be experienced in, in, at this time, there is something awaiting you that is far greater and far better and far more delicious yet to come if you just wait. And so here's where the heart of Asaph begins to spiral, and there's two things I want to look at, envy and doubt. First, the envy of the wicked. To envy is to want what someone else's life has and to feel that they don't deserve the good that you do deserve. It's basically saying to God, why are you giving the good to them that that I deserve you to give me? And that's where envy takes over, right? And you notice how the psalmist thinks that the wicked, as he describes this, literally there's three things. The wicked are, and here's the word, and a word you should always avoid using, always, write down that word, always. How come the wicked are always healthy, haughty, and happy? Right? He's basically saying they have no problems. They're always, God, healthy, happy, and haughty. Haughty, they stick their fists up at you and go, look what I'm getting away with, and God's not doing anything about it. They wear their pride like a necklace. They are fat, right? They're they're healthy. And not only that, they're happy and doggone it, I hate them. It's, oh my goodness, this this family's always on vacation. These people always have tequila in their hands. They're always at the Cardinals game. They're always getting job promotions. They're always so pretty. Wow, another girlfriend, and she's even hotter than the one before. God, I, I hate you because I don't have this. What? Why, why do they always, I mean, their lives are perfect. This person always has good things happening to them. Whatever way you want to go. (laughs) One goes up, the other goes sideways. Man, the world on my device and the people that live in that world are always being blessed. Man, God must love them so much. Because, boy, if God loves them and they're the the wicked, (laughs) then... I'm supposed to be his kid and he doesn't do anything for me? And here's where the spiral begins. Three things that plunge you deeper and deeper into this season of resentment. Three things. You ready? Bitterness. Number two, self-pity. And number three, apathy. Apathy. Catch yourself at some point, stop the cycle. Right? What, what is bitterness? It is, it is that root, that seed that pops in through hearing, through seeing, 
that says, I deserve what that person has. I deserve where that person's going, what that person possesses, all the successes that that person has in their life. I deserve that. And God, I am bitter towards you because they're getting what I deserve. And I'm mad and I'm frustrated and I'm going to just tell you, God, that I'm really angry because you know my commitment to you. You know my desire to to honor you. You know my walk of holiness and how I'm trying to be righteous and I'm keeping my hands clean with innocence and I do all this and I do it to what end? That I continue to experience the spiral in my life and they, they, Oh my goodness, really? God, let's be honest. I'm bitter towards you because it doesn't seem like you've done anything good for me. God, you always punish me. They're always happy and I'm always experiencing discouragement. If you let that root of bitterness take a hold of your heart, it will lead to self-pity. And some of you like to party, and I'm going to talk about this, the pity party. I like to party because it's all about me and what I don't have and how angry I am with God. And here's the pity party, right? That this person comes to this conclusion. Look at verse 12, 13. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. I have chosen holiness to what end? I have walked in righteousness and look at my life. Will someone cry with me or for me and join me in my pity party? And let me just tell you right now, the pity, the self-pity comes from a place where your messy insides are being compared to their happy outsides. And I'm going to tell you right now, what God does is he gets us into right perspective by reminding us that it's who we are on the inside. And if you knew the hell, the torment, the unsatisfaction, the uncontentment that resides within them, yes, the facade looks pretty, but the inside is messier than yours. See, what we, what we tend to forget is that there's a perspective that we don't see into their lives. We don't see into their hearts. And I'm going to tell you, the more glitzy and the more glamorous they are on the outside, probably the more messy and hurt they are on the inside. And God invites all this messiness into his presence. He says, come before me and, and let me look at your heart. And, and it's this issue of sin. And there is no reason to have self-pity because what do you deserve as a sinner before a holy God? See, what self-pity does, it forgets about that. It forgets about the fact of our sinful condition. It forgets the fact that we don't deserve God. And and what happens is when we have this pity, pity, pity party, it drains all the joy out of our lives. And this is why the Garden of Eden was never enough. God has set you up for something fantastic, but yet... If there resides this bitterness and the self-pity inside, it's going to lead you to the third point, apathy. You just don't care. Let me just tell you, this is a dangerous level to be because with apathy comes inactivity and when there's no activity, you cannot even begin to budge in a direction that God wants you to move in. Because the question is, when you find yourself in this pit, are you just going to sit there and just be bitter the rest of your life. I've had family members adopt this, this lifestyle, and let me trust you, let me tr- it, is, it is nasty. And we, of all people who claim to know Jesus, should not be in this place. Question is, what movement does God want? Because in that place of apathy, the second point, doubt begins to set in. You doubt God's goodness. And this is what has happened throughout Scripture. Adam and Eve doubting God's goodness. Abraham doubting God's goodness. David doubting God's goodness. How about the poster child of all this? Job 
doubting the goodness of God. And here's what's crazy about Job. This is why Psalm 73 is better than Job, because Job doesn't get an answer. All Job gets is an opportunity to try to explain how, how nature, creation, the world operates, and God throws him these softballs. I, I call them softballs because with God, anything is a softball, right? You tell me how Leviathan works, Job, and you know what? I'll answer you. You tell me how the cosmos works, and I'll answer you, and Job just sat in silence. Why? Because he cannot explain the depths of God. Job never got an answer. Praise God for Psalm 73 where he does give us an answer that we are no longer to doubt the goodness of God. And there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Can I mention this real quick? And you need to understand this. There is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt can exist in the heart of a believer. Doubt can exist in the heart of someone who loves Jesus. Doubt is different than unbelief because doubt comes from a struggling mind while unbelief comes from a stubborn heart that refuses to surrender to God. See, I struggle in my journey, but that doesn't mean I've given up my faith. Doubt is not the unforgivable sin. Doubt is that doorway by which God gives every single one of us to move through so that God can prove his goodness once again to you. Unbelief is a refusal to accept, and you've closed your heart off to any activity of God. So there's a difference here. So look at the wrong conclusion he makes, right? Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, verse 13, and washed my hands in innocence, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Now notice the, the spirit of, of Asaph, and just tell me that sometimes we've been there where we just see everything as if God's punishing us, disciplining us. There's nothing good. There's no sunny days. There's no joyful moments. God, you chasten me all day long. You torment me every night. Do you think that was really the case? See, when we're in this spiral, right, we begin to exaggerate like crazy. Like, for, here's the greatest uh, marriage advice right now. Never say never and never say always to your spouse. Amen? Spouses, married couples, right? So here's the wrong conclusion. Let's talk about this. What is the advantage of being a Christian if those who are not Christians get what I want and I don't get it? And not only that, but I don't get what I want and I have troubles on top of it. It seems like I'm being punished for trying to be good. And, and, and here's the conclusion. Piety doesn't pay. Being righteous doesn't pay. Moral earnestness is a waste of time. I love how Charles Spurgeon put it. He said, strange that the saints should sigh and the sinners sing. Let's settle this right here, right now. We do not serve, worship, follow God for what we can get out of it, but we follow and serve and worship God because he is worthy of our worship and service regardless of what he allows to come into our lives. Amen? Amen. Practice it. It's easy to say, hey amen, hallelujah in church, preach the pastor, and live out there, and all of a sudden switch into a commercial basis relationship with God. We are classic cost-benefit analysis. Aren't we? Like, what is the cost to what are the benefits of my relationship with the Lord? If you do this, you do this. And we go out into the world with this transactional mentality. And I'm going to tell you right now, God does not operate on a transactional mentality with his creation. He wants you to love him and follow him and trust him even when it doesn't make sense and not for what you can get out of it. Come and gone are the believers who operate off a commercial mentality. By God's grace, this man does not get stuck in this pit. God sh is going to show us now how to turn a resentful heart into a grateful heart. And I wouldn't be a cool white pastor if at this moment I didn't talk about Kanye West. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I interject Conway, Kanye into this right here, right now, because I pray that what this man is standing for 
is still the same thing he's standing for a year, five years, ten years from now, forever. If you haven't sat down to listen to Kanye's new album, Jesus is King, you need to sit down for 30 minutes in an undistracted place and listen to it from start to finish. Several things I've observed in listening to this, and, and again, Kanye is not my dude. Uh, it's not my genre of music. But I will tell you that what ha Kanye has written surpasses a lot of the music the church has put out in the past 20 years. There are a few songs that I sit there and go, man, these are awesome. But what Kanye has done, he's moved the needle. And the message from start to finish is this. I'm no longer in a pit. God's raised me out of that pit. I'm no, no, no longer singing the song, I am a God. But now I'm singing, Jesus is king. And he wrestles with what people are going to say about him. In the, there's a song in the, on the album that says, I know I'm going to get flack. And I know the biggest judgment I'm going to get is from the church. Christians are going to judge me and say, well, what's Kanye doing, right? Here's what I know is that what he speaks and what he shares is gospel truth. And here's the testimony of someone who, boy, lived for himself. And now he's saying, now I'm going to live for Jesus. He's singing, he's making it public, right? It just came out a couple days ago. Millions and millions and millions of hits, millions and millions and millions of downloads. There's even a movie out in the theaters based upon this. And the movie doesn't even portray him on stage doing his dance. It is all about creation. It is all about song. It is all about less on me and more on him. I'm going to tell you right now, I've listened to the album six times now. It's good. I was playing it this morning. I'm like, I should just step off and just play it right now. But what God is doing in his heart, I pray, is, is a genuine work. And Kanye's stepping up, and he's actually saying things consistent with the psalm where he's saying, you know what? As someone who's been in the wicked category and had prosperity in my wickedness, now I'm in the righteous category, and I want you to know how empty it was over there. Don't envy me. Don't doubt God's goodness, because what I had there was empty. It was futile. It was a dead end. It was unsatisfactory. It did not bring contentment. It didn't delight my heart. I am a God? No, he is the God. And until you know the goodness of this God, you will continue to be unsatisfied with anything this world offers. Check it out. Check it out. So how do we become God-focused? How do we rally around this idea that Jesus is king? How do we adopt an eternal perspective that comforts seven steps? Here we go. So we've had to descent down. And anytime you, you head down, you know you got to come back up. And, and while there's only three steps down, there's seven steps up. Doesn't it seem like life is like that? Why can't the journey out of the pit be easier than it was in? Because this is the, the seed of, of the enemy, right? He, he, he can get you like that, and, and the restoration process is longer than the sinful process we stepped into. So notice what the psalmist says. Seven steps to, to being comforted by God. Here we go. Starting at verse 15. Ascent step number one, edifying silence. Now this is an interesting point. Edifying silence. He chooses to stay silent on behalf of what the church role he has is. He is an influencing agent in the church and he doesn't want to vocalize his, his doubt, his frustration. Notice what he says, verse 15. If I had said, I will speak this, behold, I should have betrayed the generation of your kids. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. So he says, I have something that I need to settle in my own heart, and I'm going to protect the people of God by not sharing it, lest there be someone else weaker in the faith, and it plunges them even more headlong into unbelief. And I was thinking about this in my life, and the fact and I'm sure many of you could probably identify with this, there's things you don't share with other people. Not that you want to live a closed off and 
an uncommunicative life with people, but there's some things when I'm around people I don't share that I am personally wrestling with. Could be my wife, could be my kids, it could be you as a church. Why? Because I need to realize that in each of these avenues, I am an influential agent and I don't want to sabotage anyone's faith. I will trust God to settle it in my own heart. That sometimes is edification. The building up of the body as I wrestle with God over something that I just need to wrestle with him over. Number two. Ascent step number two, shifting vision. Perspective. I can no longer just be consumed with this. I can no longer just be like, what's, what's everyone else doing? What does everyone have? What is everyone, you know, what's everyone getting from God? What is it I don't, you know, you need to shift your vision. You need to stop allowing these other visions to come into your head, into your heart. Notice what he says in verse 17. Until I stepped into the sanctuary of God. Circle that. Here's the major pivotal turning point in the psalm, right? Until I came to the place where God is. Until I came to the place where I saw things from his perspective, clung to his understanding, his explanation, his word, his work, all those things. Until I came to that place, I was not able to experience change. I'm coming into the place where you, God, are working and I'm going to shift my mentality from natural thinking to spiritual thinking. Write those two phrases down. Because you and I have a choice every single day. Will I just go along the path of natural thinking, just things that the the world says, the things that the world does, the things that the world writes, or will I embrace spiritual thinking? The only spiritual thinking that God has given to us is in the word of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I don't have it on the screen, just going to have to write it down, says, these things are given to us for they are spiritually appraised and the natural man does not understand the things of God, but you who are part of God's plan are given the ability to understand them. When will you disregard natural thinking and embrace spiritual thinking? Because yes, We believe in thinking believers. We believe that personal doubts and envy expose theological gaps in our lives that God's word is meant to fill in. When things don't make sense and our doubts expose those things we wrestle with, I love how Tim Keller says it. He says, in Christianity, you feel better when you start thinking properly. Some of you are going to hate that. For some of you, that's not your temperament. But don't you see this man goes into the sanctuary to understand, right? He goes into the sanctuary and he says, you will never get out of your spiral unless you go to God saying, the reason I'm mad and the reason I'm depressed and the reason I'm discouraged is because I'm missing something in my thinking. God, fill it in. And most of us are not allowing God to fill in the gaps. And I love this, because here's where God says, I invite you into my presence, and you can come into my presence hurt. You can come into my presence confused. You can come into my presence with all of your garbage. And if you come with humility and adoration, God is going to speak to you and remind you of Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Don't forget these verses, right? Where God says to us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are, higher than the earth so my ways are higher than your ways and your thought my thoughts your thoughts he is god you are not he is creator he is we are creation and when we come into the sanctuary of god we have those gaps in our lives filled in and we are humbled and it brings about a heart of adoration Now think about this. It is the sanctuary of God where there's two things present. Write these down. Bonus points, notes for you this morning. In God's sanctuary, there is always two things. God's word, God's work. God's word is his revealed heart for us. His truth, that which is objective. When we enter the sanctuary of God, it always involves God's word. Without God's word, the spiral downward continues. 
With, without God's word, frustration continues to, to be embedded in our hearts. Without God's word, resentment, bitterness, envy, doubt, all continue to take over. God's wor- word is like the roundup that we squeeze on those weeds that grow up in our hearts. Amen? But then in the sanctuary is also the place where there's God's work. Because it was in the sanctuary. See, it would have been one thing for Asaph to enter this temperature-controlled sanctuary with a glossy pulpit, upscale band setup, gel-filtered lights, and a smoke machine, right? And it's just like, yeah, Jesus is cool. Jesus is rad, la, la. Right? No, he doesn't walk into that. He walks into an environment where there are knives and there is blood and there is the stench of dead animals and he walks into a place and he says, this is where sacrifice happens and the sacrifice happens because I'm a sinful person and he's a holy God and he says, there's a life to be demanded because of your waywardness and an innocent creature will take your punishment in order for you to know joy and for you to know hope and for you to have life and he steps into that sanctuary where there's blood and there's this disgustingness and he realizes that who am I I should be the one on the altar I should be the one sacrificed and what Asaph realizes is that that God's work is that his mercy has chased him down and been given a gift that he deserved to die but instead something innocent stood in for him church that is the cross church that is Jesus This is God's work for you. You don't sit there and say, oh God, you don't like me. Oh God, you don't care for me. Look at the cross of Christ and be reminded of what he has done for you. When you step into the sanctuary of God, you not only have God's word, but you once again understand God's work. The truth of God's redemptive mercy comes rushing back at us. And this is why we celebrate communion. This is why we sing songs about Jesus and the cross. Because the moment you start feeling self-pity, that is the moment it is crushed because he who didn't deserve to die did for you and me. God bless you. Let me say this. Only when God is at the center of your thinking that you begin to see things as they really are. You are all living in the matrix, right? You're all living in this fake reality without God. It is God that brings perspective to our lives. Point number three. When you step into the sanctuary of God, you begin to see the destiny. You start understanding destiny. And not just your destiny, but the destiny of those that you once envied. And how dare we envy those whose destruction is purposed? Right? Look what, look what Asaph says, verses 18 and 20. Surely you have set them in slippery places. Notice verse 2. He was the one on slippery places. But in reality, God had to change his perspective. Why? Because we as followers of Jesus are on secure places, not slippery places. But those who don't have Jesus think they're on secure places, but they're really on slippery places. See, he gets understanding. He says, surely you've set them in slippery places. You have cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden tears. And like a dream, I love this, when one wakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. Meaning they are living in a false reality and what they're dreaming of will ultimately result in a nightmare for them. And in, You think about the life people live, 20, 30, 40, 50 years just living for themselves. In the blink of an eye, it will all be taken away from them and they will be destroyed. For the writer to understand this, his anger is now turned into awareness. His anger of of what they have and how they're so happy all the time, he is reminded that justice delayed is not justice denied. Don't we need to keep eternity in view? Don't we need to think about the destiny of of all people? Like uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that this momentary affliction is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. Like Teresa of Avila said, right? What we're going to realize in heaven is that all of our troubles and our turmoils here was just like one night at a bad hotel. Anyone ever been to a bad hotel before? Yes, okay, amen. 
It's like the couple that came back. There's a story of a couple back 100 years ago. They had served God in an in a, in a international location, and they're coming back on a boat. And as they're coming into the harbor in, in New York City on this boat, there is a band, there are crowds, the red carpet is laid out, and everyone's celebrating, and they're kind of like, what's, what's the party? And someone says, well, there's a dignitary on board, and everyone's here for them. And the wife turns to the husband and says, we've spent 40 years in this location ministering the gospel of Christ. How come we don't get a reception like this? And the husband says to his wife, because we're not home yet. You're, you're looking for this? You're looking for this? You're looking for all the awards and all the... Ladies and gentlemen, you're not... This is not your home. You're a sojourner. You're an alien. You're not a resident here. You're passing through, and your home is yet to come. Your reward is yet to come. Your God is waiting for that homecoming. Be reminded that if you seek your reward here, you'll get it, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be unsatisfactory. But to hear his word say to you, good work, faithful servant, oh, that will be reward in and of itself. Jesus kept this whole idea in mind when he told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had everything in this world, the, and Lazarus had nothing. And people hearing the story from Jesus' lips were like, I want to be the rich man. I want to have everything. Because Lazarus didn't even get a crumb from the table. The dogs got the crumbs. And then Jesus continued the narrative and said this. But then on the other side, it was Lazarus who was in the place of blessing, the presence of God, and it was the rich man that suffered destruction. Now who, whose place do you want to be in? See, Jesus always wants us to keep eternity in view. Number four, as God reminds us of the importance of worship in his sanctuary and the, and the destiny of those who don't know him, there comes a, an awareness of, of confession. So there's a confessing sincerely that happens in verse 21, 22. My heart was embittered, right? I'm going to tell you one of the great works that, that the word of God does in our hearts is it, it, it pokes us, it prods us, it's like a knife, it's uncomfortable at times. And when I was embittered and, my, and I was pierced within, I realized I was a senseless and ignorant animal. I was like a beast before you. Think about that language. I've always wrestled with that verse thinking how we become so animal-like. When it comes to our, our one-upmanship with one another, our pride and our envy and our jealousy, and we become beasts because we want all the stuff that everyone else has and we forget about the one thing that we do have, and that's Jesus. I mean, what, what sort of beast has to rise up within me to want that versus this? To not see this as treasure and this as fleeting. And so we need to understand that we can come to God and say, God, I... You may use the word animal. You may use the word beast. I use a beast-like animal. I say jackass frequently in my prayers. How about you? Anyone else? God, I've acted like a jackass. And I have totally missed what is right in front of me. Because while Jesus is right there, I just tend to look towards this and like, oh, look at that dog with a puffy tail. Look at that person with a shiny car. And look at that. And God's saying, look right here. And I have to confess that. Confession should be a frequent part of our lives as Christians, ladies and gentlemen. The times when we sit there and, and ask, what made me act that way? What made me want that? What made me motivated to pursue this, to talk to this person like that, to, to act this way? We need to come to grips with what's going on inside of us. And let's be honest, this is an idol factory, our hearts, and we just want things more than we want God, and God's reminding us that there's nothing satisfactory apart from him. Number five, when you confess, when you're honest, here's the good news, is that God doesn't drive us away, but he reassures us. We are now embracing reassurance. Look at verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. Even though I acted this way. 
Even though I was a jerk and I was a bozo and I was a jackass, I am with you and you have taken hold of my right hand. And with your counsel, you have guided me and you will receive me to glory. See, the minute he came to this low place before God, there comes this instant reassurance and he realizes that God still loves him and God will not cast him out. And now he marvels at the grace of God and that's why he says, nevertheless, one of the most amazing words in this, in this verse, right? Nevertheless, the grace of God is once again apparent. And this is what the truth of God speaks to our hearts. It reassures us that God is for us, not against us. It reassures us that as far as the east is from the, is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. It reassures us that he who began a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. It reassures us that those of us who know Jesus, we are assured that we have eternal life. If you confess Jesus as Lord, 1 John chapter 5. Matter of fact, if you need reassurance for your faith, read 1 John and read it over and over and over again. That's, I'm Dr. Scott and here's your medicine for the week, all right? Take two 1 Johns and call me in the morning. 1 John is a book of reassurance. It is a book that says, you want to know who you are in Christ? Read 1 John. It takes you about 10, 15 minutes to read. You read it every day this week. I'm guaranteeing you right now, God is going to show up and say, you are his no matter how beast-like you act toward him. Number six, and when you're reassured, here's here's what we get to do. We get to take a deep breath. And this is where contentment comes in. We get to experience contentment. And you want to know how good contentment is? It is that place where you have this settledness in your heart that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. It doesn't matter how successful everyone else is. It doesn't matter where everyone else is going on vacation. It doesn't matter how pretty someone else is or how handsome someone is. What you are content with is who you are before God and you are loved as you are where you are. That's contentment. I love, can I just tell you, being a pastor and running around with a bunch of pastors and everyone talking about, oh, God's doing this and God's doing this and you know, we've got this many people and we're building it. And you know, it's like I am in that place where it's like, I'm like the Zen pastor. I'm like in that place where it's like, I have found that sweet spot of being like, Praise God for you. I'm happy where I am. Are you happy where you are? Because until you resolve in your heart and mind that you need to be happy where you are, you'll never be happy thinking that you need something else to make you happy. That's Zen right there. This is is Master Yoda speaking to the Padawans gathered at Missio. Until you reach the Zen-like place of you have what you have because God wants you to have what you have right now and you don't have what you want because God says you don't need it right now, you need to arrive at that place that says, God, I'm going to be happy in Jesus. I'm going to be happy and content where I'm at. And though everyone else is successful and has everything that they need, I realize that I am yours and you are mine and I don't need anything but you. Contentment. Live for beauty and beauty will fade. Live for money, money will fade. Live for success and success will fade. Keller says this, if you don't have God, you really don't have anything because everything is just slipping away from you. Therefore, it will be shaky to believe in God. It's more slippery not to. God can meet your needs in loneliness. He can meet your needs in despair. He can meet your needs in anger. He can meet your needs in sorrow. And there's nothing else that can do that. Augustine said this, our hearts will continue to be restless until they find their rest in you. One of my all-time favorite quotes, 1,700 years ago, written by a man who at one time in his life said, because someone told me not to pick the pears, I'm going to pick the pear because that's the kind of jackass I am. And then he realizes that all of his life chasing skirt and fruit and whatever else he wanted to chase was nothing compared to being loved by God. And he says, now I have found my rest. Church, have you found your rest? Are you content in him? Look at these verses, verses 26, 25 and 26. And if you don't have these underlined and if you don't have these highlighted in your Bibles, do it right now. Top 10 verses 
in my life? Who have I in heaven but you? Right? Like, this is like his, here's destiny, right? Like, there's a place I'm going to. There's a place you're preparing for me. And I am going because I get to be reunited with you. And there's nothing I want besides you. There's nothing on earth that I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Matter of fact, there's a great song on the Kanye album where he says this. Jesus is my king and he's my portion forever. Yes! That's what I want! What is all the wealth in the world compared with the spiritual riches of God's presence? Can the power and prestige of earthly fame trump the assurance and peace of God's grip on our lives? Are you going to tell me that there's something worth exerting your energy and your strength and your blood and your sweat and your toil more for just knowing Jesus? Or have you come to the zen-like place of contentment that Paul describes in Philippians 3 where he says, I consider everything as garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Have you even come to the place where you realize that there's nothing in heaven and on earth that's going to satisfy you more than God will himself? And the last point is this. As you make the ascent out of the, the pit, the place you arrive, you're on, you're on solid ground, you've hit the top, right? You said, I've done it! Filthy, smelly, dirty, but happy. You've resolved to declare something. There's a, there's a declaring resolve that says, verse 27, Behold, those who are far from you are going to perish. They're going to be destroyed. They've been unfaithful to you. But as for me... I'm coming back to that place I started, verse 1. The goodness of God is, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord my refuge, and I'm going to tell of all his works. The conclusion is this, God keeps his word. The conclusion is this, God is more precious than anything this world could ever offer. The conclusion is this, God is the greatest treasure any man or woman could ever have. Do we know this? Are you in a place where you can even pray in your heart? God, if you give me nothing and yet give me yourself, with that I am satisfied. God, if you don't bless me, if I have sickness, if I have poverty, if I have broken down cars and a leaky roof and screaming children, if, if you give me all of that, yet I will praise you because I have you and you need to know with you I have all that I need. See, you declare that kind of resolve. Ooh, people are going to listen. People are going to stop and take notice. Because you have arrived at the place where you say the nearness of God is the greatest good in my life. He is my refuge. He is my rock. And his word is true. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, I pray the words of the psalmist. May we realize that we have nothing in heaven but you. May we realize that there is nothing that can satisfy us on earth outside of you. And our flesh and our hearts have failed us because they have pursued everything but you. But you have reminded us, O oh God, that you are the strength of our hearts and you want to be our portion forever. So my prayer for my church, my brothers, my sisters, my family, for me, is this. That my yearnings, my cravings, my desires, my longings, my wantings is nothing but Christ. And with Christ, I shall be 
satisfied. We pray this in his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.